Hey, we're live. My name is Andy Hall. You're watching the Laughing and Disbelief YouTube channel with me. I would say, you know, John Funk, are we are we friends at this point? Oh, hell yeah. We've been friends. <laughs> I think that if you were in the Boston area, I would offer you uh, the second bedroom. I wouldn't even give you the couch. I'd give you the second bedroom to like, you know, stay, hang out as long as you needed to be in the Boston area. Yeah, you know, and this works for me too, because one of the things that I think is maybe poor about my personality that I'm working on is I want to be able to add a little bit of effective comedy into what I'm doing. So perhaps uh, if you rub off on me here, I'll, I'll uh, get better. Well, I'm very parasitic <laughs> in that way. I like to find host cells and infect them. Very well. So dude, so, so Mr. John Funk, you run yeah. Atheists Incorporated. Right. For the people who don't know you, give us a thumbnail. Give us a couple of sentences about who you are in the world. Uh, well, as far as my online personality goes, I, I'm an avid reader. You know, I have a book review channel. Of course, I have my Atheist Incorporated channel on YouTube, and I'm interested in the secular issues. I'm interested in the danger of religion and the absurdity of religious faith. So I'm trying to learn and become better. I'm trying to learn how to debate and everything because uh, the whole atheist thing is quite important for me. So, yeah. Were you brought up atheist? I was not. My mother actually used to read. Uh, she used to read from Jehovah's Witness publications. She wasn't a Jehovah's Witness, but she had just various publications because my mother uh, is a Christian. But... I never was a believer. I don't know what I believed when I was just a small child, of course, but I know that as far as I can remember back that I wasn't a believer in God. And I even tried very hard to believe in God. It was a whole thing I went through where I wanted it to be true, uh, but I never bought it. Some Something in me always thought that it was absurd. So, Sure. You know what I've seen, and this is just anecdotal evidence on my part, which isn't really good evidence, that there just seems to be some personalities that are more given to having what would be considered like a religious experience than others. Yeah. Like, like for me, uh, I was trying to explain what a religious experience feels like to my girlfriend who, it was like teaching fish poetry. She had just no idea <laughs> about, about what I was talking about. Yeah, you know, I've had some interesting experiences. When I was younger, I used to, I wanted to believe. I was probably mid-teens, and I had what I call the Holy Spirit experience, where I would get my Bible out late at night, and I'd watch these television programs that were religious, and I'd follow along in my Bible. And I had somewhat of an intoxicating experience, where I thought that maybe I was on to the deepest truth uh, in reality, and it was kind of exciting. You know, I've heard people describe it as like kind of like a positive anxiety where you can get worked up. Your your heart rate yeah. might even go up, you know, because it's a mild intoxication. But even though I experienced that, yeah, it may, may sound weird that I wasn't a fully a believer, but I was curious and I worked myself up pretty well. I've come to realize that that was just a psychological condition. But, uh, you know, I've experienced similar things. Sure, sure. So how long have you been running Atheist Incorporated? Atheist Incorporated is a fairly new venture. I did a couple book reviews maybe seven or eight months ago, and it was dead for a while. Then I met with some people uh, in the online community, and it encouraged me to up my game because I thought I couldn't get it going. But now it is going. And uh, today I've got Jenna Belk coming on. She's a celebrity in the atheist community down there with the atheist experience. She's co-hosting a lot now. So, you know, I'm working on getting interviews and everything, but it's fairly recent venture. Sure, sure. Who have you had on the channel so far? Did you have a, uh, a wide selection of folks that you talk to? Yeah, so I like to debate people. Um, about religion. Of course, we're going to talk about Ken Hovind here, but I have done several debates with just lay people, um, but I have had the, the computer engineer and philosopher Bernardo Castrupon. He's a real big celebrity in the idealist philosophy community. He has this 
idea about a cosmic consciousness. I even read one of his books earlier this year. Of course, I'm not convinced, but he's a pretty sophisticated guy. He's a real smart guy. And when I had him on, I didn't debate him. I just wanted to hear what he had to say. Of course, I stuck up for materialism, perhaps a few times during that. But I like to have conversations with people where I'm not trying to convince them that they're wrong. Um, the theoretical computational physicist, Minaz Kafatos, was recently uh, recently on my channel. Uh, yeah, so I'm just trying to talk to anybody that's smart and, and has some good insight. Outside of Kat Hovind, which we're going to be talking about within a couple of minutes, uh, what has been the most interesting or what sticks out in your mind in terms of a snippet of a conversation that you've had? You know, I had an, a conversation with a guy that was a Mormon on my mm. channel, and he seemed to be fairly rational. Uh, he made some rational points, but somehow he was still a Mormon, which is just ridiculous, right? So I guess he was more fair and open-minded than the other Mormons I've spoken to. And I want to know, what is the brain mechanic involved with someone that can be rational in a lot of ways, but then they're also, because someone like Kent Hovind is just completely irrational, right? Someone like Ken Ham, completely irrational. Right. I want to know what's going on with people that like can be philosophically sound in some ways, but then they're also delusional, you know? So I guess I would say if anything stuck out in my mind would be the conversation I had with a Mormon. I think his name was Alex, but uh, yeah, that was an interesting one. Sure, sure. It reminds me of this conversation I had back in the day. I was throwing this house party and one of my friends, a close friend who I thought was a pretty smart dude, very rational. We're just having a beer. Maybe we had a couple of beers at this point. And he just turns to me and he says something along the lines of, um, to, the ex to the point that, you know, Andy, there are monkey men out there. I turn and go, what do you mean by monkey men? Well, you know, Men can mate with monkeys. Mm. And that just came, and there was such just so much, so, so much craziness in that one statement that I felt just came out of left field. And it just left me stunned. It's like, you know, you just seem like a rational person under every other circumstance, yeah. except for this one narrow yeah. man monkey hybrid theory that you have which is obviously yeah. not true. It's obviously not true. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is something, you know, that's very similar. Probably the brain mechanics is very similar with something like that as compared to what I was talking about with that Mormon guy where people latch onto these just fucked up ideas, I guess. <laughs> right. So, so this is a great segue. We're talking about Kent Hovind for people yeah. who don't know who Ken Hoven is? You want to give us a, an overview? Yeah. Uh, Kent Hoven is a young earth creationist and he is a fraud. He's a criminal. He, whoops, what am I doing here? Talk to me for a second, Andy. I want to make sure I didn't mute. I'm going to talk to you. As ah, there we go. As no, we're good. We're good. Oh, we're so, good. I can be, so I can shut up now. Yeah. Is that what you're trying to we're tell good. me? We're good. Okay. We're good. So Ken Hovind is a career criminal. He's been in prison for lengthy periods of time. Uh, he's a scammer. He's a religious scammer is what I'm going for. Um, and he's a popular guy in the young earth creationist community. He claims that he has several doctoral degrees. We know that they come from universities that are not accredited, if he even has them. You know, it reminds me of like a serial box top degree is what he's got. If you if you collect 10 boxes of, uh, you know, kick cereal, you can send it in for a nice doctoral degree of your choice. But, oh, uh, yeah, he's a huckster. He's a fraud. He's a young earth creationist. I don't know if he really believes a lot of what he says or if he's only saying these absurd things to make money off this, because I think he's a millionaire. I'm not sure. but. Um, you know, he is a young earth creationist that's really popular with a lot of, uh, young earth creationist Christians. So I was reading that he has his own little theme park. <laughs> yes, he does. He actually invited me to the theme park, uh, when I was talking with him, uh, dinosaur adventure land. They call him Dr. Dino. Uh, he has this idea that 
The earth is only 6,000 years old approximately, and dinosaurs walked the earth with man. Uh, so he has these interesting dinosaur ideas, but uh, yeah, he goes by Dr. Dino. Dr. Dino. That sounds like a like some kind of DC villain maybe from the 1940s. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we know who you are. We know who what your uh, YouTube channel is about. Uh, we have a basic idea about Ken Hoven. Um, how did you convince Kent to come on your channel and talk with you? Well, that's kind of a strange thing because I was supposed to be going on Kent's channel for a live stream. You see, Kent, I've noticed with Kent Hovind that he's debated a lot of people and he has a dishonest way that he goes about things. And I think he may do that to throw people off or make people uncomfortable so that they can't stick to their game plan, so to speak. But hmm. I reached out to him through email. I wanted to have a conversation with him about some issues. And someone agreed on his behalf, and we met up that way, and we had a little bit of a chat that was not exactly what it was supposed to be, uh, and it really threw me off, and I just kind of didn't know what to say, the, say to the guy, because I was supposed to be coming on his channel for a live stream. We, re, we agreed as prerequisites that we weren't going to talk about astronomy. We weren't going to talk about evolution. Uh, we were just going to talk about the philosophical ideas, what I found to be the absurdities, and that is what I was prepared for. But it went a different oh. way. But so yeah, I reached out to him, to him uh, through email, and somebody responded, so yeah. It sounds like there was a bit of bait and switch there. There was, and I, I was hooked in. You can see when I start, um, if you were to watch my debate with Kent Hovind, he says, well, thank you for having me on your channel. And I'm kind of just stuck because... I'm supposed to be live on his channel, you know? So he, he set things up in such a way that he just did something else and it worked. It really did work because one of my goals was not to disrespect him in any way. I wanted people to see that I was going to come in and let him insult me and everything, but I was going to be genuine. So I just didn't know what to say because he also introduced uh, ideas that we were going to talk about that we specifically said that we weren't going to bring up. So right. I just didn't know what to make of it, but I, I did the best I could. Because he talked a lot about evolution or the religion yeah, yeah. of evolution. <laughs> yeah, he talked a lot about the religion of evolution. You know, I was actually going to prepare uh, for evolution. I had some information I was going to take in to prepare for that. And he said he didn't want to go there. So I didn't take that information. And I said, okay, well, I'll do something else. And I wasn't, I felt that I wasn't, well prepared to defend evolution uh, because I was kind of caught off guard by it, but he did rattle on quite a bit about what he thought was the the uh, religion of evolution. So that's interesting. So, so the preparation that you did do happened to be about topics that weren't really the things that he talked about. Yeah, and you know, Aaron Ra warned me that this was going to happen because I had Aaron Ra on my channel, big atheist celebrity, and 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 uh, David Fitzgerald warned me not to do it because he warned me that it would something would happen that was dishonest, where Kent would try to get over on me, and I wouldn't see it coming. And of course, I thought that that wasn't going to happen, right? But I was warned. I was warned by people who had already been through it. Uh, but yeah, he got me. Interesting. Well, I mean, I think that he got over on me in a way, but I still think that I made good points and he made a lot of bad points. So perhaps you could see that I won the debate, so to speak, because I was talking about rational issues and he was talking about nonsense, insulting me and attempting to make a comedy routine of wow. some of it. So I want to share I with you this. Bit, I want to share with you this bit of wisdom that I got from watching the your discussion yeah. with him. And I'm just going to show it to everybody. It's called Funk's Law, named after you, sir. The longer Ken Hovind <laughs> talks, the more evil he shows Christian fundamentalism to ah, be. Yeah. And so that I named that after you because there were cool. moments. There <laughs> were moments in your discussion with Ken Hovind. And it's like, wow, this just shows you. You just got to let someone like Ken Hovind talk. And they will start yeah. spouting really yeah. just crazy things. That is true. Um, you know, and I let him do a lot of talking because I just wasn't sure 
what to do because <clears throat> one of my goals was that I wasn't going to interrupt him. I wasn't going to insult him. I wanted the viewers to see that I was fair and balanced and respectful. And I thought that maybe that would help me to win some of the viewers over, right? They would see that right. he was dishonest. Um, so yeah, uh, that's really interesting that you came up with that. He does talk about a lot of absurd ideas. Uh, if you listen to him talk for just a little while, he actually sent me something for me to watch in preparation for our conversation. And it was just completely abs absurd and stupid and dishonest. So, you know, that's interesting. I'll remember that Funk's law. That's really law. Uh, the truth. <laughs> I mean, I just jotted down a few crazy stuff. Some of the stuff that he said, like in around the 50 minute mark, you know, uh, Muslims kill Christians to go to heaven. That's what will please their God. It's like all Muslims are just going to kill Christians. Um, that was the impression I got. That was from what he yeah. was saying. Uh, and then when are you talking about the genocidal romp the ancient Jews supposedly did through uh, Cana? You know, uh, he's like, yeah, yeah. Ancient Jews, Joshua did everything right. Killing women, children, the elderly. Yes. You know, disabled folks in ancient Cana. Um, yeah, totally. Two thumbs up because that's what God wanted. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of graphic uh, things in the Bible. The, the God there is killing people. He's slaughtering children. One of his main targets is children. In fact, he goes he goes to kill them all on on more than mm -hmm. one occasion. Um, but when you're a Christian like Kent Hovind, you have to try to make sense of that, and you have to try to spin that in such a way that those evil actions are actually holy actions, right? They were in the best interest of everyone involved. So that is a is a key point when it comes to the danger uh, of, of someone like him preaching these kind of things. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's really uh, just crazy and dangerous. Oh yeah. Tons of mice are saying in the, in the chat. Oh, I yeah. really don't. What I, I was don't... gonna add on to oh. that was that yeah, Christians have to try to make sense of this shit, right? This violent evil stuff in the Bible, because anyone with a secular worldview would read something and like that. And, and for one, we would say this is preposterous. This cannot possibly be true. This cannot possibly be reality in real history here. Uh, but Christians would try to make sense of that. And I actually was talking to someone online, an old friend of mine, and he's a Christian, of course. Uh, he has to defend these things. So I asked him about a story in Second Kings where God sends a couple of big bears to maul a group of children right, because right, right. they tease the man about his bald head. Most people are familiar with this, but his explanation for that was that, well, things used to be different. And, I, and I'm thinking to myself, how could that have been a, that would be an evil action if it happened right this minute. If I somehow went out and slaughtered a bunch of children in the name of God, that would be evil. But because it happened in the past, somehow reality worked differently that way. And, and that's obviously absurd. But, you know, when it, what I'm tying this into with Kent Hovind is that when you listen to him talk, he sounds like he's fairly smart guy, fairly sophisticated thinker. So he either believes this stuff and somehow he's twisting reality to make it work for him, or he doesn't really believe it. Uh, I know that a lot of religious people that are at the top, the people at the very top who are spreading the message, they're not really believers. Like Benny Hinn, he's made half billion dollars off this thing. He's been exposed as a fraud many times, but people still follow him. And, and it's just a bunch of delusion. But, uh, you know, when it comes to Ken Hovind, I don't know if he's just stupid or if he's lying. Maybe it's a combination of both. You, you know, you were saying about how he was somewhat popular amongst his clique. And I could, yeah. you know, just watching him on camera on, on your interview, I can definitely understand why he comes off as this like a vuncular fellow, an elder statesman of whatever he does. And he does speak with a certain amount of polish and authority. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he does. You know, and that's where he gets people because he manages to get people that are fairly simple people, right? And they hear someone like him talk in a way that's 
more sophisticated than they are. So they, they take for granted that he must know what he's talking about because he knows how to give the president, the presentation in such a way that it's captivating for the people that he's targeting. So, uh, yeah, I just, I don't know. Uh, Either he's lying or he really is stupid. It's hard for me to to think that he's just a stupid idiot when he speaks in such a way that makes him seem like a fairly sharp guy. So it's a mystery to me. You know, this is this is what I found with really, you know, I, I'm just an idiot. But I found this with uh, with really smart people is that they do get hung up with the, I don't know why they're doing this kind of thing. And it is an interesting conversation to have, an interesting thought experiment or something to reflect on. Why do they do those things? And, um, you know, and maybe it's my uh, anger issues that I've talked about many times, many, yeah. many times. And I'm in the, uh, you know, if it talks like an idiot and walks like an idiot, then I'm just going to treat it. Whether or not it actually is an idiot, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just going to treat it the way I'm going to treat it. Um, more of a pragmatic view of things, but I don't know. You yeah. know what? what what it just shows you this little other third bit I wanted to, to touch on on uh, about the craziness of Ken Hovind was that it just seemed to come out of nowhere when he started talking about what if there were a hundred AIDS patients and we just yeah. happened to kill them all? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? You know? Yeah. I, I didn't know how to respond to that, and I didn't know how to respond to a lot of what he said, <clears throat> but <sighs> I, I just, I don't know. I guess when, you, when you're defending a position like that, you have to make absurd points because that's all you've got. Yeah, and you have to think to yourself whether or not he's doing it specifically just to throw you off yes. your game. Because while you're trying to respond to this horrific thought experiment, yeah, he's actually now suddenly stringing out a whole bunch of other crazy words and sentences. Yeah, you know, one of the things that uh, Aaron Raw and those guys warned me about is that his technique is honed to the point where he's really good at making a mess of a person in a debate. Um, and I didn't believe it, but if you were to watch me debate some of the lay people on my channel, I think I actually do quite well with that because they aren't uh, professional con men and liars, right? Right, but right. Uh, yeah, the thing with Kent Hovind, I, I'm actually quite glad Kent Hovind has agreed to speak with me again. And the next time we do it, it's going to be quite different. You know, this was a good experience for me. Uh, not oh, only yeah. is it getting a lot of views on my channel, but I see what happened. And I, for one thing, there was some knowledge that I'm lacking because Hovind talks about, he's trying to make the case for a young universe. And he talks about our son. And he talks about the fact that as the sun ages, it compactifies and gets smaller as gravity crunches it down. And he says something along the lines of, well, if the universe were billions of years old and our sun is really many millions of years old, it would get larger and larger the further back in time we go. And it would be so large that a solar system, the way that it is, just couldn't be possible. Okay, And, and that's not right. That's not how stars evolve. And I didn't have the knowledge to counter that. So uh, I'm going to be polishing up. I actually got a book called The Atheist Debater's Handbook. Okay. And it's it, it, I actually read maybe the first chapter of it. And it's already th talking about the things that Kent Hovind was doing. Uh, so I'm going to read through that and I'm going to study some things. And, and I realize that in order to deal with someone like him, that I'm going to have to have a better game. And uh, that's that's what I'm going to be working on. So uh, I'm quite happy that that happened to the way that it did uh, because the next time it won't happen again. Right, right. You know, it when I heard that whole star, the sun kind of yeah. comment, I'm like, you know, that just is dumb enough for dumb people to believe because I'm pretty yeah. sure that doesn't work like that. Like even I right. know that when the sun goes before the sun goes and over, it's going to devour Mercury, Venus, and Earth. It's just going to get bigger. Yeah. So, so something about that just does not, you know, jive in my no. head. Yeah, and somehow every astronomer, every physicist that's ever lived, that's looked at the lifespan of stars, somehow got it wrong 
but Kent Hovind knows how stars really function. And, and, uh, you know, there's more than one way to counter someone when they bring something like that up. You can actually have the knowledge and explain to the person, this is how star systems work. Or there are philosophical ways that you can counter where you get the person to actually explain how that works so that it's clear that they don't know what they're talking about. You know, there are different techniques to countering someone in a debate. You don't always have to know the exact science involved when someone makes a frivolous claim in order to successfully counter. So uh, that's another area that I'm working on as far as being able to stop something like that and from happening because Kent Hovind is the type of person that will open an evolution textbook and look for some bizarre term in there, right? And he'll bring that up in a debate to make it sound like he knows what he's talking about. And unless you're an actual biologist, you're not going to be able to know the science in such a way to explain to him why he's wrong about what he's saying. But there are other ways to go about that. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to polish my game up for sure. Cool. So Brain Bug from the chat says, yeah. watch the late Bill Ludlow take on Hoven. It's great. Ooh. Wow. That sounds like fun. And I, I could probably learn something from that. So I'll definitely uh, check that out. Thank you, Mr. Brain Bug. Useful information right there. So he yeah. has agreed for um, Rocky Part Two. Basically, you guys are going back in the ring. Yeah, and I'm I'm gonna give it a little time. Uh, I want to do some more debates. You know, actually, I'm kind of getting into interested in this debate thing, and I wasn't so much. Um, I'm thinking about starting an de online debating club here, where we meet in a room similar to what we're in now and debate the issues. And I also am going to be defending Christianity. I'm going to put my argument about why Christianity is right, because I want to know the opposing argument. You know, it'll sophisticate my own position if I were to be able to engage in a good debate from the opponent's point of view. So I think that'll be a good exercise for me as well. Got to find an yeah. atheist that wants to do it with me, but yeah, I'm in for that. Oh, absolutely. I think if you cannot really sum up the other the other side's case and in a real way, not in, in a straw man fashion. If, if you can't sum up the other side's case then you have no business actually debating them. Yeah, that is true. And it's hard to make a good argument for something that's ridiculous, right? We've come too far with science and our understanding of the universe. We have a better understanding of our place in the universe than what our ancestors had. We've realized that the universe is unfathomably large, that uh, life on earth has been here for an unfathomably long period of time. And we have a good working understanding of how it's evolved uh, throughout time. Of course, Ken, Ken Oven would say that's a religious belief, but um, <laughs> you know, the, those, those old ancient ideas are becoming harder to defend, but I'm gonna do my best to make a good argument uh, for the case of Christianity as one of my uh, educational debating strategies. No, I think I think that's wise. I think that's a great idea. Another thing about Ken and what he's good at is that he's good at hitting those bullet points and hitting them over and over again. I, I didn't count how many times he said evolution is a religion. Yes. It, it was a lot. It was a fair amount of times. I did actually counter him with that and got him to stop doing it. Well, maybe he mentioned again, but I mentioned it. I, I said to him after he had mentioned that several times that in order for something to be a religion, there has to be a deity that's recognized and that we don't have that in the case of science. So it cannot be a religion. And he didn't argue with me about that. But um, yeah, he, he does like to go back over things many times. And maybe that's a way to stop him successfully is to make sure you stop him and check him on everything that he says is wrong. They'd make it harder to, to go back around to those claims. So, you know, I, I it just, it, it stifles me why he's doing this because it's hard for me to believe that he believes that we're evolution is not a real process happening in the universe. Uh, the universe isn't unfathomably old. Uh, everything we know about astronomy and the mechanics of light and how it transmutes through space is wrong. Yeah. So I just, I don't know what's going on with him. I mean, is he, let me ask you this as a question. Does Ken Hovind 
really is he really an agnostic that that doesn't believe this stuff but he's going on with it because he receives many many thousands of dollars in donations it's kind of like a job for him a career or does he really believe this stuff and and he's on honestly legitimate believer what do you think this is a very good question i don't know his heart it's very difficult to especially from just my limited seeing of him like with with donald trump i i think i've i think i can wrap my mind around who he is in the world because I've seen so much about him, read so much about him. With Ken Hoven, I'm not sure. What I will say is that it's difficult to speak out against the thing that has buttered your bread for so, so long. Yeah. So let's say he's been making a lot of money off this whole cottage industry of insanity that he runs. And yes. then, and then he wakes up one day and he realizes, well, this is all crap. Yeah. You know what he has as well is when, when I was about to debate him, we met over Zoom and there was the technician was there helping him. And Ken Hovind is really looked up to and respected by these people. They call him Dr. Hovind. Uh, and I think he probably gets off on that. He's the cult leader, yeah. right? He's yeah, the David good. Koresh of this community. Um, and maybe the power is just as tempting for him as the money is. Cause it's, I just, I don't know. I just seems to me like he's lying and he knows it. So I don't know. Could be yeah. wrong about it. Well, the thing is he's, he said the lie so many times it's now, or he said the thing, the crazy thing so many times that it's just second yeah. nature to him. Oh, hell yeah. He's good at making that shit up about evolution. Um, but for example, with the star system thing, that's not right. And does he really, has he really put so little investigation into the issue that he's making that claim without ever have really looked at the, looked at the mechanics of it? That's kind of hard to believe. Has he, is he really making these claims about evolution without ever have actually looking at the mechanics of it to see that it is a real process? here happening on earth. It's so obvious that it's a real process. Um, if you go out to the Grand Canyon, there are these exposed pieces of the cliff, right? Mm. And there are layers that form and we have a very good uh, geologic understanding of how these layers form and, and how long a layer takes to form. And when we go through these layers, we see fossils that are particular to that time period yeah. Uh, that those layers formed in and nothing overlaps. That's the big catch here. Nothing overlaps. Um, and human, human fossils are only found at the very crust of those layers, which yeah. is a testament to the fact that we haven't been here very long in the eyes of deep time. You know, that's check, checkmate, basically. I mean, how... How can you explain that? But somehow he's got an explanation for it. And I know his organization actually paid uh, a geologist that uh, came out. They did this video where the guy is saying, this is why uh, everything we know about geology is wrong and the earth is only 6,000 years old. They actually had a guy with credentials come along and, and uh, do that with them. But turns out that that geologist wasn't really a young earth creationist. Everything that he had ever done was good science, every book, every paper. It was just on that one occasion when they paid him to come out and say something on film, uh, did he make those claims? So that shows you the dishonesty that they'll pay yeah. someone. And they must have paid him a hefty price to do that because sure. he's got a reputation as a scientist, put his whole life into it. They must have paid him very well to come oh, out yeah. there and make an absurd claim. Sure, sure. You know, what was interesting is that he, was, he made this comment that that every star is red shifted mm -hmm. in relation to us. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure that the Andromeda galaxy is going to be smashing into our galaxy in like a billion years or something yes. crazy like that. I don't think it would be red shifted under those circumstances. I think they're going to have some blue shifted stars. Yes. And, you know, he tried this with the astrophysicist Hugh Ross. Now, Hugh Ross is a... Christian. He's not a young earth creationist. He's a scientist and he has some screwy ideas, but uh, he, he knows astronomy very well. And he, they were debating because they were debating young earth versus old earth. Basically uh, Hugh was defending an ancient universe and it came to the idea of 
light and how light propagates through space and the red shifting of light as things are further away. You know, astronomers have a very good understanding of how this works. And Hugh was talking about photons and he was getting very close to making his point, right? He was going to get one over on Hovind. So Hovind has this debating technique where if the opponent is about to make a point that he will not be able to wiggle out from, he simply won't let the opponent get that far. Uh, Hugh was talking about the fact that photons come in what we call packets. Um, so right. Kent stopped him and started making a joke about packets, right? And he then went on to talk about the fact that we don't really understand quantum physics and astronomers just aren't right about what they're talking about. And he made it into a comedy routine. He straight stopped the man right before he was going to make his scientific point. And well, you know, that, that's interesting. Jokes yeah. and, and throwing yeah. insults. So yeah, yeah, that's a debating technique. That, that is a cheap rhetorical sleight of hand that a lot of right. comedians do. A lot of politicians do. If if you cannot, and, and I think it was much ado about nothing too. Shakespeare um, makes the main character, the male character. You know, um, he can't yeah. he can't win this debate, this discussion with Beatrice, and he goes, um, "I'm just," and he just makes a joke and walks away. And she's like, "You always do this. You whenever yeah. you're about to lose, you just make this joke and you just walk away." Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah. So you got to figure out how to, how to. Um, how to fight that or how to how to work around that without him hanging up on you right because i imagine there's always a chance the guy just walks away yeah um that is true you know that's one sometimes if you can get a good moderator for a debate that will actually just mute someone's mic if they go that that route that could potentially prevent that but uh you know this whole thing with ken hovind has really inspired me there's somebody mowing grass outside by the way if you can hear that but okay no worries uh, Ken Hovind has inspired me through our conversation. What was supposed to be a gentle conversation about some philosophical issues that he turned into a debate on his terms uh, that he, he chose the content and everything for. He got me in that way. But I'm really like interested now in, in the mechanics of debate and how it works yeah. because I feel like I've basically been violated and I can't allow it to happen again. I hear what you're saying, brother. Because once you get the uh, taste for something, right? Yeah, you get the the taste for it. You know, was there a time allotment when for like how long he could talk at any one point, or how long you could talk at any one point? No, and there there sh probably should have been, and that's a point for me to remember in the future. But <clears throat> he talked for about forty five minutes, and yeah. he was talking about religion being an evolution. We can't teach evolution in schools, and and all this stuff like that. And finally, toward the end of the debate, we got around to the subjects that I did want to talk about, about right. the fact that what would a holy book sent by God really contain and so on and so forth. And he wouldn't answer my question when I was asking him about morality being a software running in the brain. He, yeah. uh, I reiterated it several times, but he wouldn't just answer the question. He was answering some other question that was loosely related. Um, and that went on for about 10 minutes. And then he said that time was up for him. He had to go. So I, I, I just, I, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's very difficult. I imagine to actively debate someone while at the same time playing moderator. I I've listened to Sam Harris, try to do it on his podcast. And, and that is just a heavy lift for anyone to do because at any point you're trying to make, the, the discussion entertaining for listeners. Yes. You're trying to think of your own point that you want to make. You're, you have to pay attention to what point he's making. It's, it's multitasking cognitively and without a moderator, I, I think it must be very difficult. Yeah. You know, preparation can help with some of that, but Sam Harris is, is, and you know, Sam Harris can struggle with something that, that it's really quite a difficult, difficult task because He's one of the best yeah. uh, atheist debaters that we've ever had. He may be the best at it. Uh, you know, I really like him and I'm going to be, no, I've read some of his books, but here's something that I want to do to prepare for uh, another Kent Hoban situation or something similar. I like to read a lot of books and I've read Sam Harris's books. I think I've read five of them. Uh, and one of them is the end of faith where he 
just cr- basically destroys religion. You make so many mm-hmm. good uh, salient points. But there's a difference between reading a book and actually like jotting down some notes to try to retain some of this in case I ever have to spew it forth myself. So I'm going to go back over the end of faith and I'm going to go back through Daniel Dennett's uh, Breaking the Spell, Religion is a Natural yeah. Phenomenon and actually study these books this time uh, so that I can retain something. And I also have a book here that I borrowed from the library, The Christian Delusion, which is a oh, series. I have of- that. I have that. Yeah. yeah. From yeah, what I, I understand. Yeah, uh, John Lof- John Loftus yes. was on my channel. I don't know a couple wow. of months ago. Great guy, great guy, smart guy. Uh, yeah. But that, I found that book to be very instrumental, and actually, I have it kicking around here somewhere because I want to reread that too. Yeah, and, and when I go through this, because uh, I've heard good things about it, I'm actually going to not just try to read through it as fast as I can, like I would with you know a novel or or right. like I was reading nonfiction in the past. I might take like. You know, one of the essays for a few days and simmer on it and write some notes down, do a little bit further investigation uh, so that I can actually recall that and hit somebody with it in the future. You know what I found interesting, just reflecting back on your conversation with Kent yeah. about his rationalization for the genocide, the supposed genocide in, in, in Cana, uh, ancient Israel's did. I said, well, OK, so why did they have to kill all the animals, too? They just went like. Like, okay, so so you're making a very strong case for killing babies, right? Right. But, uh, <laughs> but, but why would they have to kill the sheep and the goats and the cows? That seems yeah. a little overboard if you want to think about overboard. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, and, and you know, the whole thing about it is uh, that it's just so fucking stupid that it can't possibly be real history, right? That's the real right. point here. Um but, uh, you know, like, for example, when God supposedly flooded the earth, and we know that didn't happen, uh, what Christians will say was that the people had it coming. They had sin in their hearts, right? That's what the Bible says. And I'm thinking, like, so the, the newborn babies at that time were deserving of drowning because they had sin in their hearts? That's not even a possibility for a newborn child, right? So yeah, it's just nonsensical. It's stupid. Uh, the story doesn't make any sense because we know that a flood didn't happen, right? Mm-hmm. Imagine a global flood. Imagine if that flood happened uh, today. All plant life on Earth, all plant life flooded for an entire year. Yeah. There would be no surviving plants. Uh, there would be like some algae that would probably survive, right? But the fact that we can look around and see trees and a wide variety of flowers shows that we didn't have a global flood that reached the mountaintops in the recent past. Uh, so you've got to make sense of that. You've got to make sense of the moral issue with the babies drowning and everything. Just completely absurd. So I, I would have to ask you if you're if you were Kent, and I and if I, and if I ask you this question, is it possible to be a Christian, be saved, go into heaven if I'm not a young Earth creationist? What would he say? I, he would say no. Uh, you know, I've actually watched him deal with this a little bit because. Uh, Kent Hovind has debated uh, the Christian astrophysicist Hugh Ross, right? Mm. And Kent would say that he's not a real Christian, okay? That he's not really a Christian, that you cannot be a Christian and believe in his Jesus and be uh, an old earth uh, creationist, that it just doesn't work that way. So the according to him, like many religious cults, you can only be saved if you're a part of that particular cult and what they believe. I've even seen people say you can't be saved unless you're baptized in their church. So no, you'd be doomed if you had a scientific worldview and were still a Christian, according to Ken Hovind. Fascinating. That's fascinating stuff. So we went over a lot about your conversation with him. Is there anything I didn't cover that that you think is sound, that, that is important? I'm not sure. Uh, you know, that thing with Ken Hovind, I think, was unfortunate. Hmm. And I'm looking forward to my redemption with that because I'm going to become a good debater and I'm not going to allow that dishonest, dishonest technique to happen with me again, whether it's Christianity or some other thing. You know, I should have yeah. did debate club when I was in high school. Then I'd be on my game. But, um, yeah, I, I'm not. I don't think you missed anything. You mentioned the ridiculous dinosaur park that he's got. So I think you covered it pretty well. (laughs) Right. So uh, 
we were on the Daily Atheist Morning Show. Yeah. And you just happened to talk about jujitsu. Yeah. How does jujitsu inform going forward, or if it does or not, about how you're going to be treating uh, these these debates? I'm not sure if it plays a role. Um, I know that you have to be, you can't allow someone to, to push you over in these debates, right? So perhaps yeah. there's some discipline there that's related to both jujitsu uh, and debating with people. Sam Harris is very good at not allowing people to push him over. You see, there can yes. be a very fine line bet be between just stopping someone and letting them go on and, and leave them some rope to hang themselves. Sam Harris is very good at that, where he'll let someone spew the bullshit for a while, right? And then he'll come back and and make an absurdity of them. Uh, you know, yeah. there are different different techniques for that. But, you know, perhaps I seemed a bit meek in that debate. And, and, and a lot of that was to do with that it was something other than what I expected. I wasn't sure how to respond because... You know, he started talking about things that we agreed we weren't going to talk about. And that was like everything that he talked about was astronomy and evolution. We weren't supposed to mention those issues. And then when we got around to what I wanted to talk about, he was out of time. Uh, so perhaps, perhaps, perhaps like with jujitsu, you've got to be rigid, but you don't want to be so rigid uh, that you break. Yeah. So, uh, so I've got to, I've got to work that technique with my debating strategy where I'm, where I'm standing up for myself and not allowing to be dumped on, but understanding when it's proper to let someone go with the bullshit so that I can then bring that around to haunt them. You know, it's a sophisticated process, but I'm working on it. It is. And <laughs> it, it is, it, it is difficult because Kent likes to, to give, uh, to backhand people, yeah. And then immediately just view just like inanities, just that these absurdities. So it is definitely picking your battles and trying to figure out where you squeeze them. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. So what else do you got going on, dude? You, what's your yeah. other channel like? You have another channel where you uh, review literature, where you review books? Yes. So I've got some several different things going on. Uh, Atheist Incorporated here on YouTube. I'll have Jenna Belk. I'm going to be talking with her later today. She regularly co-hosts the Atheist Experience. So I'm moving mm -hmm. on up. I'm like one step away now from getting Matt Dillahunty on the channel. Yeah, for um, you. I, I'm working with her. I'm going to set some things up for that channel soon. I'm actually going to be doing a video because I got a green screen recently and I'm trying to figure out how to do that. But I want to set up, uh, we had a guy on the Atheist Morning Show uh, and you were on for that episode where he did like an atheist news program kind of thing. Yeah. And yeah. I want to do something similar to that because I want to do my video, uh, 10 Reasons Why Evolution is a Real Process Happening Here in the Universe. Uh, and I want to be able to like be at my news desk and have images come up and stuff like that. So <clears throat> I'm working on sophistication with my channel, but I do a fiction book channel, uh, Reading Funk, where I go through a lot of different literature. Just right before I got on with you, I finished filming uh, my video where I walk the audience through my Stephen King collection. So that's uh, doing pretty well. I'm almost at 3,000 subscribers with that one. So... Uh, that's a lot of fun for me, yeah. And I've got a nonfiction book channel, Nonfiction Funk. I'm growing that almost to 100 subscribers now. Cool. And I've even got a channel where I'm like, I'm working on being a motivational speaker. Uh, so that's uh, a work in progress. It's small now, but uh, I even got a prison channel that's finally starting to do well. So I've got a lot going on. <laughs> a prison channel. All right, so so yeah. <laughs> we're gonna have to talk about, about adventures in your prison channel. Okay, so it's about prison. That's why I've been yeah. able to discern. Right. But but what ex what what do you talk about? How do you approach that? Well, it's fairly new thing. Um, I did a video about what to do if you have an encounter with the police, and it's about not oh, speaking yeah. to the police. Okay, it's about not speaking a single word. And I put that up and not a whole lot of people watched it. I got some views. Then I did a story about a child molester that I watched being tortured on a daily basis. And I put that up and not a whole lot of people watched it, but something happened where the algorithm picked that up recently. Mm. And 
uh, like, yeah, my subscriber counts now starting to go up a little bit from that. So I'm going to jump on that bandwagon and I'm going to start putting more content out. Um, I've got one that I want to do. Oh, oh my God. I've got one about the bedpost tobacco thing. You want to hear this real quick? I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. <laughs> Please tell me about this. I was in a prison. Uh, well, a series of prisons where they sold tobacco and people love their tobacco in there. And they, they decided they were going to take tobacco out of the prison system. And this was a big deal, right? They, uh, they set a date where they were going to stop selling it. And there was like a two month period where all your supply had to be used up and the employees weren't bringing it in anymore or anything like that. And this caused uh, some, so it caused the tension to go up. In oh, the place, it did. Okay? So in these prison bunks, they're metal bunks, and there are kind of like caps on the top of the bedpost. And people for a period of years would put trash and cigarette butts and things down in those sure. bedposts. Okay. And it was that stuff stayed in there for years, the stuff at the bottom. So what happened when the compounds ran out of tobacco or they were real close to running out? And this was getting serious because some guys, some investors decided they'd buy a couple cartons of cigarettes. Uh, when they realized it was going to stop and hold yep. those over for several months. And a lot of those people ended up getting beaten senseless oh, for yeah. those cigarettes. But people started digging the shit out of the bedposts, right, to get the cigarette butts and empty the tobacco. And there'd be rust in there. They'd have to try to work it out. Trash was mixed in with it, right? They'd have to try to work it out of there. And I actually was digging in a bedpost there was a pill bottle from like 1998. It was an old ass pill bottle. And, and there was like tobacco underneath of that thing. So some of this shit was like older than 10 years old, these cigarette butts. And it was a thing. People would clean the beds out. They'd sell that shit. And uh, it was called bedpost tobacco. <laughs> you know, the, the idea about shutting down uh, a, a group of guys, a group of people who probably potentially super violent, maybe violent, uh, and cutting them off from their from their choice of addiction, uh, substance. I mean, that just seems like poor, well, poor policy. Well, you know, I, they claim that it was to reduce uh, healthcare costs for them. You know, I'm not a cigarette smoker anymore. I was at that time, and I smoked my share of that bedpost shit. It was getting real serious. Um, chew, you know. Dip, yeah, snuff. Uh, what people were doing was that they were selling rechew because this is when it started getting desperate. It was tobacco that had already been chewed, but it was saved out and dried, uh, and then it was good for a second run. And a lot of people would buy this. People were even rolling the rechew up and smoking it with Bible papers. And I tried it. It was it was like real nasty, right? But it, it was even weird because uh, a lot of the the cops would smoke, right? And they weren't right. allowed to bring the tobacco in anymore themselves after because it was tobacco free campus type deal and what would happen and i was even doing it was where uh, an officer would be walking the yard smoking a cigarette uh during the period of time where uh, we were supposed to use the last of our supplies and you yeah. would see people following him right sure. they were like trying to like nonchalantly follow the guy because they wanted to get that cigarette when he threw it down uh so yeah it was just it was crazy there was a lot of fighting there was a lot of uh a lot of extortion and everything happening over those damn cigarettes. I remember hearing, and this was a study, this is like a years ago, about how the symptoms of certain varieties of schizophrenia for some people are lessened, are ameliorated by cigarette smoke, by smoking cigarettes. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate that a lot of prison in, Amer in the United States or America, it's basically a psychiatric hospital with bars. Um, there's a lot, I'm, I'm sure that you know this. I'm not telling you anything. There's a lot of people with psychiatric issues who should not be in prison, but are. Yes. And I'll tell you, we still got time here. Oh yeah, dude. Yeah. Uh, there was a man in prison named Ryan Pesek. He was in Lake Erie Correctional Institution with me. Some of these guys, like you said, they they should be in an, in a hospital, but they've slipped through the cracks in the system. Yeah. And these people are a lot of times the worst people to slip through because they're easily victimized, right? There was yeah. this guy named Ryan Pesic. And he was a drug user and he had had a stroke at some point, some, wow. something to do with an overdose of drugs yeah. and he had a fucking stroke. Sure. And he would have problems. It was really sad too because he had like occasionally a, a, vo vo a vocabulary word would come out of his mouth that 
A simple person wouldn't know those. It was clear that he was an avid reader and like a writer. At some point in the past, he was a sharp mm -hmm. guy, but that stroke fucked him up. And yeah, he yeah. was taken advantage of a lot. It was all fucked up with what was happening to him. Uh, not as bad as, as the child molester thing, that video that's actually doing pretty well. You might want to watch that. It's fairly uh, funny. Well, yeah, it did. But, uh, you know, Ryan Pesek should not have been in that place. He was just too fucked up to even make a game plan for himself for survival. And uh, he wasn't like getting beat on a lot and stuff, but people wanted what he had. Yeah. And he just didn't have no way to defend that. It's hard enough sometimes if you're targeted, especially by a gang, what the hell are you going to do then? And if you're a Ryan Pesek, then you have no chance in hell. So uh, it was yeah. just really sad scenario for him. Yeah, yeah. Well, we should try to leave this conversation on a positive <laughs> note. <laughs> so, well, uh, where, so, so you got Jenna coming on the channel. Uh, where can people find you online and what else you got going on? You know, I was curious. Uh, are you a religious believer? Were you at one time? Oh, yeah. yeah, I was. Yeah, I was, I was a Baptist. Sure. I have my surviving religion series on my channel. I've actually interviewed two people in the recent past that were survival, survival, uh, survivors of yeah. Amish cults. And this is all fucked up, this Amish cult shit. You better check my channel out and check, yeah. see what I got going on. But I'd like to have you perhaps on my channel if you'd like to do it. Oh, and we yeah. can talk about your experiences for my surviving a religion series, oh, yeah. but yeah. the two things that I would plug here is my Atheist Incorporated YouTube channel and my Reading Funk YouTube channel. That's what I've got going on. Cool. Well, hey, thanks a lot for coming on my channel. I'd love to come on your channel, and I think yeah. we're going to be on the Daily Atheist Morning Show at some point together pretty soon. I'll be there uh, tomorrow morning, actually. Well, dude, I will see you tomorrow morning then. Thanks for having me on. All right. Hey, everyone in the chat, thanks for showing up. Be strong. Take care.